I'm here to talk about The Peacock Room by James McNeil Whistler. This is the most original and famous room in 19th century London, and it is scarcely mentioned without also mentioning how the wealthy patron refused to pay the artist who created it. Now, I am myself a decorative painter, and I do this kind of work for a living, so I have a little insight into how this happened. How this room came to be created and what happened afterwards is a little bit more complicated than I can do in 10 minutes, and it's certainly not something you're going to see in Wikipedia in a nice condensed little nut. But the story goes is that the artist and his patron fought a war for well over a year. The arena, the dining room of a tastefully decorated Victorian mansion. The stakes, $200,000 and much more. And the prize, I don't know, we'll see if anybody won anything. To set the scene, let's travel back to Victorian England in the 1870s. This is typical Victorian art. It is all about edifying moral lessons, classical subjects, and romantic history. Now, I'm not saying that these aren't beautiful, but they are proselytizing, English values. And the avant-garde artists, like Rossetti here, they reject all of this in favor of beauty without any other lofty message. The aesthetic movement, as it came to be known, proselytized beauty. And their motto was art for art's sake. They invented it. In addition, there's a fascination with Japanese art, as you can see in these two paintings. This kind of work is rejected by the Salon in Paris, and it's attacked by critics in London. But they are adored by a growing segment of the population who just happens to be buying a lot of art. So now, let's meet our contestants in tonight's conference. James Abbott McNeil Whistler is an American expat, very methodical and skilled painter of great vision. He is the leader of the aesthetic avant-garde. He's also a dandy and a bon vivant, and you know that because he's wearing a monocle. <laughs> he, ex <laughs> he excels at the art of self-promotion. Many of his paintings have really long musical titles, like Symphony in White Number no. 3. Or Arrangement in Black and Gray Number no. 1. Also known as Whistler's Mother, yes. That's great. This is all going to be on the test, by the way, so. <laughs> so <drink more. laughs> and in this corner, we have Frederick Richards Leyland, a self-made tycoon. He is a shipbuilder. <laughs> He's also an amateur musician devoted to Chopin. He plays the piano. And Whistler credits this favorite patron of his for inspiring these musical titles for his paintings. Leland commissions a number of paintings from Whistler, including this portrait of him and this one of his wife, which is called Symphony in Flesh, Color, and Pink. <laughs> yeah. So, now we know where we are. In 1875, Leyland decides to build a new house in a very fashionable district of London, and he hires Thomas Jekyll to decorate the dining room, where he has decided to put one of Whistler's paintings, The Princess from the Land of Porcelain, to have pride of place above the mantle. Now, Mr. Jekyll, the architect, is a preeminent designer in the aesthetic style, and he's famous for Anglo-Japanese metalwork and furnishings like really cool sunflower and irons. Especially for Mr. Leyland's dining room, Jekyll has designed a lattice of walnut shelving to display blue and white porcelain, a very valuable collection of china. Jekyll's design also features 16th century leather wall hangings, which were part of the dowry of Catherine of Aragon. That is the first wife of Henry VIII and the longest lived. <laughs> so that's 400 year old leather wall panels that once hung in the bedroom of the King of England, and for which Leyland pays a thousand pounds. That's nearly a hundred thousand dollars now. When the room gets to be pretty close to being done, 
Jekyll decides to ask Whistler for a little color consulting. And Whistler comes in and says, hmm, I don't think that my princess looks very good with that leather. <laughs> so he volunteers to retouch. <laughs> retouch the walls with yellow and gold and, and make them look nice. <clears throat> so Leyland thinks, well, this is all pretty set. I'm, I'm going to go back to Liverpool and work on some more ships. Thank you. <laughs> Alone in the house, Whistler decides his, to start his enhancements by gilding every single piece of wood in the entire room. <laughs> gilding and, and then painting peacock feathers all over the entire ceiling. Gilding and then painting peacocks on the shutters. Enhancements. Basically, he makes this entire beautiful walk-in work of art, which he then entitles Harmony in Blue and Gold, The Peacock Room. Voila! <laughs> now, I look at this, and I can totally hear what's going on in his head, because this is what I would be saying. Like, I don't know how I can work with these ugly leather walls. And I just think that blue and white china looks so much better with gold leaf. And you can never have too much gold leaf. So we're going to put more gold leaf on the shutters. And you know, I think Leland's really going to like this. He's going to come in here and he's going to piss himself because this is beautiful. <laughs> this is <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> this is what artists are thinking when they're in your house. While Leyland is gone, Whistler writes him a few times asking for money, for gold leaf. <laughs> he also has a couple of press conferences, and by the time Leyland gets back to London, London is talking about this room. Which is not at all what Leyland expects. And not only that, but you know, he painted over the leather that hung in the bedroom of the King of England, and that cost a thousand pounds. A hundred thousand dollars worth of leather, covered in blue. It gets better. Whistler leaves an invoice for 2,000 guineas, asking for more money for the extra work that he did. That's like $200,000, that's a lot of money. And Whistler thinks it's marvelous, and he just is popping by all the time with potential clients and showing off the room, and he just doesn't, doesn't understand what the problem is. He says, I have a quote. My dear Baron, I gave you a brilliant surprise. The room is alive with beauty. There's no room in London like it, mon cher. See, because he's wearing a monocle, he can also speak French. <laughs> yes. And he signs everything ever yours, James McNeil Whistler, with a little butterfly which is made out of his initials. A signature butterfly. And here is Leyland's response. Look, Jimmy, I've received your bill, and I think we should settle up our account, but I really don't think you should have involved me in such an outrageous amount of expense without at least telling me ahead of time. Yours truly, Frederick R. Leyland. Oh, but mon cher, you know, I just painted on and on without design or sketch. I put in every touch with such freedom, and the harmony and blue and gold developing, and you know, I just forgot everything in my joy of it. <laughs> Edward Lewis, <laughs> the artist formerly known as Whistler. Give me a fucking break. <laughs> it's like, it just happened. Like, I was just taking a shower with my girlfriends, and you know, they just, I don't know, it just happened. <laughs> not, not that I would know. So anyway, I'm calling bullshit on this lame-ass, arty-farty excuse, because the fact is that this is a lot of work, and Whistler is known as a methodical painter. I think this room was liquored up and seduced. 
by a very smooth talking artist who had a lot of preparatory sketches. <laughs> books and books of them. They found them in his studio after he died. So I'm not buying that story. Anyway, back to Leyland. He doesn't want to pay the bill. He says these shutters are stupid. They're ridiculous. Please, let's come to an agreement. Fine then. We shall split the cost of the room. But mon cher, art will outlive money, and your fame is now assured as the unappreciative owner of a work of art whose price you refuse to pay. Ever yours. There are dozens of letters back and forth between these guys, and it's, it, it actually goes on for nine months. It takes nine months before Leyland finally relents and sends Whistler a check for a thousand pounds. Now, <laughs> can you actually see that? Okay. <laughs> pounds are not the customary silver guineas. Guineas are worth a little bit more than pounds, so now the price has been shorted by about $3,000, and this is the customary way you pay tradesmen, not artists. So Whistler is super offended. So what does he do? Well, of course, he breaks back into the house <laughs> and paints another mural. <laughs> Behold, and of course, another passive-aggressive note. Behold the silver crest peacock on the left, c'est moi, the artiste. The other, bedecked with coins and bristling silver feathers on the throat, well, that's the patron in his customary frilled shirt front. Now the painting is known to all of London as Art and Money, or the story of the room. Sir, you have degenerated into nothing but an artistic Barnum, a con artist. I will forbid my servants to admit you, and if I find you near my wife... <laughs> I shall have you publicly horsewhipped. <laughs> Yours truly, Frederick R. Leyland. <laughs> well, from a business point of view, money is all important, but for the artiste, the work alone remains the fact. Ever yours, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. <laughs> what about Thomas Jekyll? What happened to Thomas Jekyll? the original designer of the room, whose work has basically just been shanghaied in the middle of this. Well, he didn't take this very well. They found him on the floor of his studio covered in bits of gold leaf. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and he died three years later in an insane asylum. This is what we call collateral damage in the War of the Peacocks. Now, the following year, Whistler was bankrupt and he was forced to auction off his house and everything in it. This is just another painting, don't pay any attention. Among the creditors, none other than Freddie Leyland, who for some twisted reason has been going around buying up all of Whistler's debts, like the gas bill and the grocer's tab, which if you think about it is a really calculated long-term revenge. This painting was left in plain view when the creditors arrived to liquidate the house. Here's Leyland dressed in a hideous peacock suit, sitting on top of Whistler's house, wearing a frilly shirt. The title of the painting on the sheet music there. It's called The Gold Scab, or Eruption in Frilthy Lucre. <laughs> enfin, the artiste gets the last word yet again, and the message this time is loud and clear. Hey, asshole, my art is more important than your money. Now, Frances Leyland left her husband just after this incident, and she took her portrait with her. <laughs> Frederick Leyland kept the peacock room exactly as Whistler intended it until after his death in 1892. Whistler never saw the room again, but he did live long enough to see it sold to a more appreciative owner. The princess and the entire peacock room moved to America, where Charles Langfrier built a special wing into his Detroit home. In 1908, the Peacock Room became a sensation all over again, this time in the US. 
Designers and artists praised it as the first example of Art Nouveau decor 30 years ahead of its time. Now it's in the Smithsonian, where it remains inspiration for subsequent generations of artists and designers. And a fabulous example of that is this outstanding installation by Darren Watterson, which was created just a few years ago. The peacocks here are tearing each other's entrails out. <laughs> And the shells are collapsing and oozing under the weight of all that animosity. The peacock room of Dorian Gray. <laughs> so as a piece of art, the peacock room may well smack of pride. But I see in it now, 140 years after it was created, an enduring message about the struggle of beauty to survive in a world that insists on justifying the cost of everything. And as Whistler predicted, his patron's name is all but forgotten while his art remains beautiful and remains relevant. So, please join me in a toast to that which endures regardless of infamy or expense, to art for art's sake. Yeah.